Uh, thank you all for um, coming here this afternoon. Um, my lab has been interested in the pathogenesis of uh, human T-cell leukemias and lymphomas. And um, the T-cell uh, diseases, these are a real diverse group of cancers that affect both children and adults. And um, most pathologists will classify these according to their cell of origin. And so uh, the cancers that arise from T-cell precursors are called T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemias, predominantly occurring in kids, but also occurring in adults. Um, and this is a transformation of T-cell precursors out of the thymus, whereas transformation that occurs in more mature T-cells are broadly characterized as T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. And um, so my lab has touched on all of these different um, T-cell disease subtypes, uh, but the story that I prepared today uh, has to do with a project with a specific uh, disease called T-cell large granular lymphocytic leukemia, or T-cell uh, LGL. And this is a um, somewhat rare uh, disease that occurs in uh, adults, although I'm seeing more and more of this in my clinic. Um, it's uh, classified as a unique disease entity by the WHO and the ICC. Uh, hematopathologists are quite aware of it. It's a clonal outgrowth of a CD8 positive cell uh, with the immunophenotype um, that is shown. And some patients will present with relative uh, increase uh, in lymphocytes um, with no other disease manifestation, but almost all the patients eventually will develop significant anemia or in many cases, very significant uh, neutropenia requiring um, therapy of the uh, LGL. So the way it is diagnosed, you can see these uh, granulated lymphs in circulation. Uh, this is a picture of one of those granulated lymphs right here. Um, these T cells infiltrate the peripheral blood. They're seen in the spleen. Sometimes the spleen is palpable in patients uh, and a bone marrow biopsy usually reveals the LGL cells infiltrating there as well. There's a very um, uh, well-known association of T cell LGL occurring in the context of other autoimmune diseases. In this case, Sjogren syndrome and rheumatoid arthritis as well. And then many patients with TLGL, you'll find uh, the presence of rheumatoid factor uh, antibody as well, as well as other uh, autoantibodies. So um, we've been banking, as I said, uh, in my clinic, we've been accumulating more and more of these uh, patients through referral. And we've been banking many of these cells. They've had a consistent CD8 positive uh, phenotype as shown here. Uh, many of these patients, almost all of them actually, have required therapy at some point because of significant um, cytopenias. So um, some years ago, we had done uh, extensive comprehensive genomic profiling of diverse T-cell neoplasms, both the TALL that I, as well as the T-cell non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Competing against a lot of noise right now, <laughs> but the... Um, we had done this by a capture NGS and um, uh, looking at about 450 oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that were deregulated uh, across the board in T cell neoplasms. And what was notable to us was, uh, including in multiple other studies that we had published, was the high frequency of JAKSTAT deregulation uh, across the board for all of these uh, cancers. You can see that the tyrosine kinases most commonly mutated were JAK1, JAK3, um, as well as uh, uh, gain-of-function mutations observed in the transcription factors STAT3 uh, and STAT5 uh, as well, occurring in up to a third of uh, cases of T-cell neoplasms. So the, the JAK-STAT pathway, the JAK1 and JAK3 in particular, is responsible for signaling downstream of multiple cytokines that are absolutely critical in developing T cells as well as in the um, activation and the function of mature T cells. So um, when we uh, look through our data set, and this needs to be updated, we've looked at an extensive number of TLGLs now. Uh, but one of the most frequent mutations that we've observed in this TLGL um, subtype of disease has been the gain of function in STAT3. 
And um, in the literature, others have done similar work and we'd estimate about 40% of cases have STAT3 gain of function. What's interesting is even if the patients don't have STAT3 gain of function, many of them will have um, activation of STAT3, which you can observe with, by nuclear STAT3 or constitutively phosphorylated STAT3 uh, in these cells. Um, other uh, mutations that we've observed in LGL are the ones listed below there. And then it's notable that the JAK and STATs, because they fall in the same pathway, are mutually exclusive mutations in, uh, in LGL. And then the mutations that happen within STAT3 um, all occur within the SH2 domain. And um, the mutations confer constitutive upregulation of STAT3, it's constitutive homodimerization with the resultant uh, activation of STAT3's targets uh, in the LGL cells. So um, for this project uh, uh, that I want to talk to you about today, uh, we know STAT3 is an important driver from our studies, but because of these autoimmune manifestations, um, we are very curious to know what is the role of the T-cell receptor and what is the role of putative antigens that might exist in the, um, in the disease course or the pathogenesis of the disease. We know cancer in general is the uh, multiple mutations are accumulated over time that confer clonal growth advantage, but antigen TCR interactions, as you know, also result in um, clonal growth advantage. And the question is, does it have a role in this disease? So I'm gonna to present to you a case that uh, came to us in clinic that's very interesting. This is a 67-year-old uh, gentleman um, who uh, presented with profound uh, neutropenia. Uh, I diagnosed him with T-cell uh, LGL. We did analysis of his DNA and found the STAT3 typical SH2 gain of function mutation. Um, he was uh, not responsive to multiple chemotherapy uh, regimens, as you can see here. Um, the neutropenia was quite profound and he developed uh, very significant infections because the neutropenia was so prolonged over several months and we could not get his cells to um, respond or to be able to treat his LGL cells. So some of those, uh, his disease courses uh, is shown in this curve here of the uh, absolute neutrophil count. When he first presented to us, he was hospitalized for a very long time his neutrophils were basically zero. Uh, he eventually responded to um, high dose steroid and cyclophosphamide therapy. As you can see, the spike in his neutrophil count only to relapse again a few months later with just profound neutropenia and the recurrence of uh, bacterial infections. So uh, in the red, you can see that uh, in the peripheral blood, at least um, his neutrophils um, were zero for over prolonged uh, months of time, uh, whereas the lymphocyte count was quite in the normal range. Uh, it was not entirely composed of uh, the clonal LGL cells, but the clonal LGL cells comprised about 30 to 40 percent of the uh, periphery here. So when we did bone marrow biopsies for those specific points, you can see here that the uh, entire bone marrow was variable in cellularity, but the myeloid progenitors were completely missing. He was completely eliminating myeloid progenitors from his bone marrow. So of the cells that you can see here, most of all of them are um, CD3 positive and the CD8 positive infiltration of the LGL cells into his bone marrow. Myeloid progenitors, as you can see on the differential counts on the left, were completely missing at both time points when he had developed significant neutropenia and significant disease. So the bulk of the cellularity was lymphocytes. And interestingly, the erythroid progenitors, which are called normoblasts here, were intact. He, he was not touching his erythroid progenitors, but the myeloid progenitors were being uh, completely uh, decimated. Uh, by his LGL cells. So on the top is the biopsy, the staining for the T cells, and on the bottom you can see some of these LGL cells and some residual myeloid progenitors um, that only some of the earliest myeloid progenitors could be found, but most times you couldn't find any there. 
So what we had done, we had, uh, we banked many of the uh, samples and time points during his disease course. And so we collaborated with Selecta to try to understand um, the disease course uh, by gene expression initially. And what I'm showing here is a global view of gene expression of uh, his LGL cells that were collected at uh, very specific uh, time points, which are shown on the top. So the leftmost column is a PBMC control. And then we have uh, patient cells, the LGL cells that are collected right at the onset of disease. You can see his neutrophils are still 500. Then um, when disease was most severe, when neutrophils were zero, and then when he recovered uh, with uh, neutrophils of about 2,400. And then we also had uh, an independent sample of his LGL cells that we were able to in vitro stimulate uh, with CD3 and CD28 along with IL-2 and 15, just a familiar cocktail uh, to try to activate uh, his uh, LGL cells. And you can see here that um, all of the, the disease, um, the, dis uh, the LGL cells that were uh, isolated at time points of, of active disease clustered very closely together. And then th th at the time of uh, when LGL was treated and there was recovery of neutrophils, um, it showed a completely different um, gene expression pattern. It's also demonstrated in the principal component analysis on the top right here with this, um, with this blue sample uh, correlating to uh, when uh, he was in remission. So we're still working on deconvoluting some of this data in collaboration with Selecta because I think some of the gene expression changes are due to the recovery uh, of neutrophils. Um, however, when we have, uh, are looking closely at time points where the neutrophils are zero versus neutrophils right at the onset of disease, you can see subtle changes in gene expression that we're looking at more closely that might give us biomarkers for disease activity and activation state. Um, and especially differences between in vitro activation state versus in vivo uh, activation state. So. Um, when we looked uh, at the global gene expression and asked which disease pathways were uh, enriched when disease was most active or when neutrophils were being destroyed, um, some of the top pathways that were falling out are listed here. Top amongst them was actually viral protein interaction with um, cytokines and um, cytokine receptors. So um, one of the questions we asked are, what, what's the role of the TCR uh, that is being expressed by these uh, LGL cells? So for this purpose, we did uh, single cell error sequencing as Alex just described, and we used anti-CD3 to sort out his LGL cells into plates um, in which the uh, TCRs uh, could be uh, amplified as many clonotypes as, as we could conceivably get. And so the different colors of the wells um, tell you um, how well we did in terms of our single cell sorting into wells, which wells were productive uh, in terms of amplifying uh, the TCR uh, clones. And then simultaneously, as, as Alex just went through, the technology allows us to do uh, gene expression analysis on these exact same clonotypes. And that's shown in the heat map right here. So in the very top um, uh, heat map are all the cells um, that are not of the predominant clonotype. But the LGL cell that is of the predominant clonotype is shown on the bottom heat map here. And so looking through this pattern, you can see that the T cell LGL cells fit most closely to an immunophenotype consistent with an infector memory cell that has re-expressed CD45RA. So it is not exhausted. Um, in fact, our in vitro stimulation experiment showed that these cells were uh, proliferating um, with the antibody, uh, with the um, cytokine cocktail, along with 3 and 28 
Um, so the T. emera cells have been described in the literature as being senescent, but these weren't senescent either. They were quite proliferative um, and they were quite um, cytotoxic uh, in all of our um, assays. So, and then, but we did this with the purpose of trying to isolate the main clonotype and, what we, and to march towards the TCR specificity uh, in this patient's disease. So we got the uh, alpha-beta pairing uh, out of the assay um, from Selecta. And these are the top clonotypes that fell out, uh, paired with their V-alpha and V-beta chains. So the main TLGL clonotype is shown in the top row, and I've highlighted it here. And so use the CDR3 uh, sequence is what's highlighted here. And then we started looking um, for matches for, uh, for potential epitopes that this CDR3 uh, might identify. And we resorted to uh, existing VDJ uh, public databases, as well as uh, a separate algorithm uh, offered by uh, ImmuneWatch, uh, a company that has an algorithm called uh, Detect. And um, actually both results were consistent and some of the best matches are what I'm showing here. So the CDR3 um, from the databases are shown here for a given TCR and everything boxed in red matched the clonotype of our LGL neoplastic clone. And uh, you can see it's a very close match. So what is the candidate epitope that this might be uh, recognizing. Well, it turns out actually all of the clonotypes that we isolated um, were uh, predicted to match CMV antigens, um, the topmost being PP65, as well as immediate early antigen um, for the LGL clone. So that made us get the peptides for CMV to make tetramers. Uh, I should also mention that of the um, of the clonotypes that we isolated and the predictions, uh, we were also able to predict the, 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 the exact HLA match for the patient uh, was, was also uh, predictable. And anyway, a, a, a tetramer uh, with the CMV antigen PP65 was able to efficiently label the LGL cells shown in the flow cytometry in the top left. The blue is a negative uh, tetramer uh, control tetramer, whereas the red is a uh, fluorescently labeled PP65 loaded um, HLA-A2 um, tetramer that efficiently labels the LGL cells. So um, this has led us down a road towards um, really thinking about CMV and potentially subclinical infection that might be going on that might actually initiate LGL or propagate um, LGL. So um, I think there is chronic antigenic stimulation from CMV in the bone marrow uh, of many of these patients. And then it turns out from older literature, and now there's about um, additional papers as well. I've just highlighted the, the, the very first paper to describe this, but it turns out that myeloid progenitors are a reservoir for latent CMV uh, infection. And one wonders whether the re-expression of certain antigens is uh, initiating LGL uh, process with the STAT3 gain of function occurring uh, in the pathogenesis. So um, again, this is uh, still uh, work that's uh, in progress and with additional TCRs that we've isolated from our LGL patients, we are consistently getting CMV as uh, candidate epitopes for these uh, different clonotypes. But I think in the end, it does imply a role for antigenic stimulation um, in the pathogenesis of uh, TLGL. So I wanna thank the folks in my lab. And like I said, this is work in progress and we've appreciated the collaborative nature uh, of the relationship with Selecta. And, and they've not only given us data, but they've helped us with uh, its interpretation um, and there's been a lot of back and forth, which I've appreciated. So let me stop there.